Hayao Miyazaki was born in 1941 into a world already at war. His first evacuation to a new city was at three years old. When that city was bombed when he was four years old, he evacuated again. Hayao is famously anti-war for perfectly human, understandable reasons such as the act of war continually uprooted his childhood and killed those around him. Hayao Miyazaki is a lifelong and devout pacifist. Howl's Moving Castle The film makes me feel like I understand him as a person. This film is loosely based on a novel for young readers of the same name by Diana Wynne-Jones. Like any film adaptation or pretty much every time I've talked about this in the past, adaptations must stand on their own apart from the book on which they were based. This is a personal film for Ohio. Now I'm going to talk about nihilism in a whimsical, accidental way a lot in this piece. I don't think what I'm saying would have made a lot of sense without 2020 doing the best damn illustration of a term I'm heretofore making up, situational nihilism. We are born into a world that is not the one we want. Try as we might, the world does not change. So we make our own world. Nihilism is sometimes not a choice we make. We pile comforts one on top of the other for self-care for so long, we might not even realize how much we are avoiding the world around us. We don't choose to have no beliefs. They are taken from us. We didn't choose this, the world did this to us. In other words, here comes another breezy movies of Mikey banger. Howell in this movie is a fancy dude, but he's also an utter train wreck. A story of two kingdoms that rely on Howell so much that both sides of that war draft him into their side of it. His majesty requires that every witch and wizard aid our homeland. I bear an invitation from His Majesty the King. Please inform Mr. Pendragon that all witches and wizards are required to report for duty at the palace. They're the same picture. Or a thing he vehemently doesn't want, and before you know it, you're a psychotic bird monster. Wait, hang on, is that... Nope, yep, right there. That's It says psychotic bird monster. Okay. Before this film, when Hayao was nominated for an Academy Award for Spirited Away in 2003, he declined to come to the United States and participate in an American award show while that country was simultaneously invading another country. Kind of a baller move in hindsight. A move that, gotta check my notes here, yep, did not end the Iraq War. All of his films are personal, but this one feels especially so. Feelings and emotions that have been bubbling up for his entire life, a film where one of the most delightful and relatable characters is a literal heart of fire. All of this as if to say, good morning, we are all burning away slowly, and everything is fine. is Howl's Moving Castle did quite well at the box office if you consider every country except for America where it did quite poorly. It opened against Batman Begins which is unfortunate because I'm pretty sure Christian Bale was workshopping his Batman character in the English dub of this movie. Howl. I'm sorry Sophie, I should have gotten here sooner. I definitely am not starting a fight but Sometimes dubs have other experiences nested within already brilliant things. But did you know? Pete Doctor got the job to supervise and direct the English language versions because of how indispensable he'd been at Pixar since practically its beginning. The proto Batman alone. You, you can't even break your own spell. And then on June 17th, it opened up 12 places behind Batman. But, you know, 202 screens versus almost 4,000. Film math isn't real. In a lot of ways, Howl's Moving Castle is a movie about trusting whatever obtuse family unit you've constructed out of the people that are thrust into your life. And, consequently, breaking free of your own self-destructive nihilism. 
To put it into as simple words as I can, fixing your life is going to take more than just you. Especially when you live in a nationalistic war state where everyone's partying in the streets because apparently war is dope. Cannon hurts. Oh, subtlety. 2021 is here and subtlety is in a casket being paraded through the streets. Sophie just wanted to make hats. She never asked for this. Sorry, looks like you're involved. Sophie, who inherited her father's hat shop, a character that just wants to do her job. A character who always inherits other people's messes. Which is sort of ignoring the obvious, which is that Hal's Moving Castle is effortlessly one of the most moving and beautifully animated experiences you'll have at the movies. It pushed envelopes in such subtle ways it's easy not to notice. The Moving Castle itself has this almost Terry Gilliam quality to the way it moves around, rotating all these disparate layers on top of each other to create the presence of a lumbering mass composed of motorized band-aids stuck on top of other band-aids, situated atop for mechanical chicken legs. It is less a living establishment and more of a series of additions Hal just sort of magicked into the world on top of one another. It is an extremely toxic space for one to live in, and all at once it feels comfortable all the same. I absolutely wouldn't mind living there for a bit with Calcifer for the wise perfect boy Flame Sprite. At the beginning of the film, we are introduced to Sophie, a milliner who inherited the weight of her father's business. The world is suffocating for her. Sophie just makes hats and largely pushes out the world around her. The movie even frames the nationalistic war state as persistently invading the space around Sophie. Her co-workers go out for a night on the town, fraternizing with the regime, and Sophie wants no part of it. Sophie is trapped in a life she doesn't love, surrounded by a world that is exceedingly dangerous. She controls very little. So she makes gun hats and tries to put it out of her mind. Anyway, members of the armed forces proceed to be like, we crime in tonight, and corner Sophie. Howl, the lonely vampire wizard, happens upon her and helps her escape from the soldiers, but simultaneously introduces her to the beings following him, which are the henchmen for the Witch of the Woods, the most uncomplicated Miyazaki villain ever. Her actions are poorly thought out and abusive as hell. Sophie takes one walk with the Vampire Blood Wizard and the Witch of the Waste puts an absolutely unforgivable curse upon her. The Witch makes her old. The Witch just takes Sophie's entire life away from her and ahead of her just for looking. And worst of all, the Witch doesn't even know how to uncurse Sophie, which Karma is going to have something to say about. The Witch of the Waste is, in turn, cursed to live her true age, though the outcome is essentially the same thing as she cursed Sophie with, which makes her absolutely delightful even when she has moments of lucidity where she demonstrably remembers the power she used to wield. It's a complicated emotion for an audience to feel. The villain's journey was from uncomplicated to complicated. Or you could talk about Turniphead, a cursed prince. Maybe the reason your kingdom's always at war is because you're throwing curses around at anyone who looks at you crooked. Turniphead used to be a prominent war boy mixed up in all of this. Now anything he can't communicate in basic pogo maneuvers, he can't communicate at all. And as a scarecrow, he's willing to sacrifice himself and his well-being to save his imperfect family unit. I bet you have a lot of time for introspection as a scarecrow with a root vegetable for a face. Did I? Did, is that? Or Calcifer, a flame who needs burnable material to survive and power the castle. A literal falling star that Hal saved or cursed, depending on your worldview. Hal relies heavily upon him to power and champion his entire castle. It's exhausting. Just literally burn yourself out. Forever. For me. Thanks. XOXO Howl. P.S. I'm glad I saved you. And Marky, who at best you could describe as Howl's trainee slash unpaid intern, who sure seems to do a lot around the castle. 
including poorly faking his own age to cover for Hal. A big, incomprehensible family unit thrust together through circumstance. None of the characters in this story make their own choices. Outcomes are merely thrust upon them. Naturally, one accepts their dystopia and turns to nihilism. If you can't affect change in the world, you turn away from the world. At least until things start getting better. Each of these people is completely helpless and alone demonstrably. They come together and they're able to move forward. Studio Ghibli films often require a lot of unpacking to understand the motivations of all characters involved, but here, they're all being crushed under the weight of a world and system they do not control. On some level, all of them have given up. But on another level... Over the years, I've used this show to illuminate struggles in my own life as illustrated by film. It was cathartic to share why certain films affected me at certain times. Art can be pretty cool like that. Perhaps other people felt the same. Moon being a film about a dude's body dying while my body was doing exactly the same. I can't even listen to my voice in that episode anymore because I'm so messed up. I mean, this is a sci-fi movie episode, and I tend to knock those out of the park. In the last couple years, I've definitely shied away from getting too personal in an effort to let film stand more on its own and less about my own experience. I chose Howl because I wanted to comment on the creeping nihilism we were all beginning to feel. I know everyone knows what this feels like. What if anything mattered about the soul-devouring crucible we all experienced through the bulk of 2020. We rely on the people we never expected to, sometimes too much. Which brings us back to Howl's Moving Castle, a film where Howl builds this extravagant castle that never really stops moving, a castle that does not survive the film. I thought I had a pretty solid episode written that spoke to the moment we are in, and then the winter storm tore through Texas in late February. Tara and I were forced to evacuate our home after almost two days without power. We were literally burning scraps of wood we found in the garage to heat food to at least have something warm to eat. It wasn't the best. <laughs> Luckily, other friends who had some power were able to put us up. What we didn't know while away from the house was that the pipes in our attic and walls were bursting and flooding the entire house and basically ruining everything but the basic structure, I guess. Howl's Moving Castle also does not survive the movie. The irony was not lost on me, which led me to a simple realization. We are all Sophie. It would be so simple if all we had to do was make hats. That things weren't waiting in the shadows unbeknownst to us. Sophie never did anything wrong. Howell sucked her into his wildly out of control life. A pretty horrible thing happened to her, but that was the situation she was in. People were counting on her. It's a movie where the characters learn to see outside of themselves, and that seems pretty relevant to me right now. We can't give in to nihilism. Life really never does get easier. Maybe you just get better at navigating it. I wonder how Hayao Miyazaki must feel about it, finally unburdening feelings and emotions that he has felt literally since he was three years old. But perhaps it's easier to say... Good morning. We are all burning away slowly, and everything is fine. This episode is sponsored by, uh, us, I guess? I guess consider this part an ad? The shirt type that has always been good to us as a business was the Fight Less Talk More Say Sorry Sometimes shirt. 
That very fun saying came from the Princess Mononoke episode, which feels either ironic or clairvoyant at this point in time. We actually had a new design for that shirt printed up and ready to go in early 2021, but obviously we had to vacate our home. That made us temporarily delay the launch, power down our store, and the show. And of course, lug a house full of merchandise and our entire lives across DFW in a RAV4 because... We are just now back to capable, have an apartment and a base of operation, and it really wouldn't suck to sell some shirts right now. Thank you all for the support during this frankly strange and surreal time. It has definitely been all caps a thing. Also, there's Gary Pins. I feel like I buried that leak. Hi, hello. Me again, the the guy with the doing the voice in the thing you're watching. Um, hey, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash movies of Mikey. That would really help us out in addition to, you know, buying our shirts or whatever. Uh so this was a funny episode. Um <laughs> watching it, we we sort of clued into the the just distant stares of everyone in this movie and the nihilism sort of inherent to uh, Howl's Moving Castle, and then we lost our house. And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm dealing with the exact same, aww, beans. Um, so that was, that was the thing. We have an apartment now, we have a temporary workspace, so it's going okay. Uh, I mean, the nihilism is always there. And so, to this episode is always there. Uh, that's fun. Fuck insurance companies. Bye! <laughs> <laughs>